Uh, so nice to be with you this evening on Christmas Eve's Eve, our second annual Christmas Eve's Eve service. And kids, I love having all you guys in the service. You bring such joy and Christmas spirit into the room with you. So thank you all for being here. I hope you all have enjoyed our Christmas hymn so far and our Christmas foliage and candles, which are fake, but the real candles we'll light in a second. I'll tell you how and when we'll do that. Uh, if you haven't met me yet, my name is Justin, and I'm the pastor here at Aletheia. We've been spending the month of December looking at the Christmas accounts or the Christmas stories, the beginning of... Um, of each of the Gospels, except for Mark. We spent the entire fall in Mark. We're, we're putting Mark on the shelf just, just for a little bit. Uh, and we've been looking at each of the birth narratives and how the Gospel writers begin their story about Jesus Christ. And we've been doing it in conjunction with our Big Give campaign. And we've been asking the question, what exactly has God given to us in sending His Son, Jesus Christ? Now, last of all, we have saved the strangest Christmas story for the end. Uh, we are going to look at the gospel according to John, and there are no shepherds, there are no stars, there's no manger, there's no lack of room at the inn, there's no Mary and no Joseph. John just gives us a double barrel shot of theology from the outset. But this is really cool because... The synoptics give us a lot of information about the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth, but John tells us who Jesus is. And the hope of the Christian faith is not just about the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth. It is who exactly this person is who was born in Bethlehem so long ago and why we celebrate at this time of year. So join me in your Bibles, if you have them, in John chapter 1. We're just going to read verses 1 through 13. We'll also have the Scripture up here on the screen. I'm going to read, and then we're going to pray, and we're going to explore this very unusual Christmas story. Here we go. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life is the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through Him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." This is the word of the Lord. Join me and let's pray and ask him to guide us as we study it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words, your scriptures to us that unpack the extraordinary nature of Jesus Christ whom we worship, Jesus Christ whom we celebrate at this time of year. God, would you take this passage and open up our eyes to who Jesus is in new and extraordinary ways that we might see Jesus Christ for who He is, God of the Word. We ask you to lead and guide us in your scriptures by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all admit that this is strange? <laughs> and this is the second time we've read it. We actually read th these verses in our Advent readings, and they may or may not be familiar words to you, but... They're, they're pretty strange, and yet John's entire point in writing them to us is that we would not just understand it, but believe it. John, in writing this account, both at the beginning of his book as well as at the end, he makes his purpose in writing his gospel extremely clear. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may believe in the name of Jesus. 
Now, if John wants us to believe what he's writing, he must also want us to understand what he's writing. So this, what, what came to mind while, while thinking about this was a little while back, because it's Christmas time, I wanted to take my, my little girl on a daddy-daughter date. So I took her to the mall in the hopes that there would be Christmas decorations because she is all about Christmas trees these days. Every third and fourth word is Christmas tree. So I, I took her there and lo and behold, there was a Santa's playhouse type of display thing. Santa wasn't there. It was kind of a weird time of the day. And even though the ropes were across before I could say anything, she darted underneath them into Santa's playhouse and she was roaming around. And so I looked to see if there were any express um, like signs that said you are not allowed in here when it's closed and there weren't. So I just let her play. All the rule followers in the room are just like, ah. But I looked for signs. There were no signs. So she was small enough to fit under the railing. It was clearly fine. <laughs> But as she's playing, and I'm just watching her enjoy it, I look, and up above, there's this, in big, bold letters, believe, believe. And it got me thinking, as a dad, and as a follower of Jesus, what exactly I want my daughter to believe about the Christmas story as she's playing in Santa's playhouse. Now, the Santa story is fun, but what I really want her to believe is the story that gave rise to these types of stories. I want her to believe that back in the 300s, there was a man by the name of St. Nicholas, after whom Santa Claus is actually fashioned. And he was a Christian man. He was the leader of the church. He was a bishop. And he had this habit of, of secret gift giving. But the story that inspired his gift giving wasn't Santa. Santa was fashioned after him. But he believed this story about who Jesus is, and that's what inspired his generosity. And standing there, looking at these letters, I was struck by both needing to understand and believe what John is writing here about who Jesus is. So, here's Jesus' proclamation, explanation about who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is God the Word. Jesus Christ is God the Word. And I want us to ask and answer two questions about that. What does it mean, and why is it really, really good news? So, to the first question of what exactly it means, he begins in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the more familiar with your Bible you'll get, here's what will start to happen. As you're reading through some writings, say, in the New Testament, you'll notice an author's word choice, and it'll pique your interest, and you'll think to yourself, wait, I've heard this before. So when John begins his letter in the beginning, can you think of maybe another place in the Bible where these exact words are used? In Genesis, the very first words on the very first page in the very first chapter of the Bible. That's not a mistake. John wants us to think about the Genesis story as we're reading through his account of Jesus Christ being God the Word. Now, if you rewind in your brains to Genesis, here's how the creation story goes. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And a couple verses later, it says, and God said, let there be light. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then, John takes those words and says, Not only is the Word powerful, the way that God created things, but He is, in fact, a person, Jesus Christ. Then He takes it further. Verse 3, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's a pretty big claim. All things were made through Him. And if you, re- if you rewind in your mind to Genesis, you see God speaking into being all things of creation. You know, plants and birds and animals and eventually human beings. It's all things that He speaks into creation. Now we learn the person of Jesus Christ is the one through whom everything was made. Now how exactly does that work? John explains it in verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In Him was life. 
Here's a huge claim, okay? Like, get, get, get what John is saying here. In Him, Jesus Christ, God the Word, was life itself. Life that gave light to man. I mean, think, think about the first humans opening their eyes, being aware, understanding what's going on, perceiving, seeing that there is existence, there is, there is awareness. How? Jesus Christ, God the Word. Everything was made through him because life was in him, and the life was the light of men. The life inside Jesus Christ, God the Word, is the very reason that human beings were created and could be aware and alive. Now, this is John giving us, like, Jesus Christ's credentials, his power, his capability. Like, I can't just speak a bowl of chicken teriyaki into existence, right? It's a weird choice at Christmas. I should have made some sort of Christmas reference as opposed to chicken teriyaki, but that's what, I must be hungry for dinner or something like, like that. So if you and I can't even speak into existence a bowl of chicken teriyaki, think about the power of God represented in Jesus Christ that he spoke and through Jesus Christ all things were created. Now, this is mind-bending and extraordinary, but is John simply giving us insight into the way in which God created the heavens and the earth? No, he's taking it further. If that's where he stopped, it would have been interesting. We're like, wow, cool insight, John. But not in a rude way, what does that have to do with me? So, so verses 1 through 4 are telling us that Jesus Christ is the one through whom God created everything. And then he tells us this in verse 9. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Now we begin to answer the question, why is it really, really good news? We understand what it means. And the reason it's really, really good news is because Jesus Christ didn't just remain unseen. He took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he came at a point in history, born in Bethlehem, (laughs) arrived in human flesh. Extraordinary. But the, the question still stands, why? Why? Well, the good news begins with bad news. In verse 10, we learn that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. When Jesus Christ arrived on the scene, what you see in his life and in his ministry is that people consistently don't understand who he is. That he is God made flesh. God God standing there as a human being in the flesh. And yet people do not understand, even though they were made and created through him. This is the evidence of what happened to human beings through sin. That we, through human sin, were so alienated from our creator that when he showed up on the scene, in the person of Jesus Christ, they didn't even recognize him. And that, that would be a grim account indeed if that's where John ended. But he doesn't end there. He goes on in verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There were those who rejected him, those who didn't receive him. But to those who did receive him, he gave the right a new status, a new authority to be a child of God. Now, this is a word that is often thrown around in church circles. Maybe you've heard it. If you become a Christian, you are a child of God. And we get that in a certain sense. You know, there's a relationship there. God is my father. I'm his child. He loves me. He cares for me. He guides me. And all that is true. But what what does verse 1 through 4 have to do with the relationship of God the Father to those whom whom he has given the right to become children. And this is where he lands in verse 13. This blows my mind, and I hope it does for you as well. Who were born not not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Here we see it come together. Jesus Christ, God the Word, present at creation, the one through whom through whom creation is brought about in power and in wonder. 
And what happens when Jesus Christ shows up on the scene for those who have received him? New creation. Rebirth. They become radically reborn human beings. This is all throughout John's gospel. This this is amazing. When, When you believe in the name of Jesus and you receive him, new creation has dawned. Not just outside of you, but inside of you. God remakes you. You are reborn in our in kind of maybe a term that you've heard in some way, shape, or form, that you are born again. Yes. Yes. The very same power who brought about creation at the beginning brings about new creation in those who believe in the name of Jesus and receive him. So here's my very simple question. Have you believed in his name and received him? If the answer to that question is yes, Hear me on this. New creation has dawned inside of you. In the words of the Apostle Paul, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. What this Christmas season, what feels like it's fracturing? What feels like it's breaking apart? What feels old in your life? What feels tired? What What causes you fear when you look to the year ahead? What causes you exhaustion when you look at the year behind? Isn't it true that around Christmas time, in our traditions, there's this weird nostalgia and melancholy that goes along with it? And sometimes when we we come to Christmas time, the best we can hope for is a temporary suspension of reality so we can take a break and a breath of fresh air until we have to hit next year. Hey, if you have believed in the, in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God the Word, new creation has dawned inside of you. You are a new creation. I know maybe what happened this year was tough, it was exhausting, it was a battle, that, that you had to fight some things that were coming against you, and right now you feel exhausted, you feel tired, you're walking in here, barely here, If you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, God the Word, and you have received Him, you've reorganized your life around Him, new creation. Maybe your answer to that question is no, that you haven't yet believed in His name or received Him. But this evening, something has kindled in your heart. As you hear these words preached about who Jesus is, Something is resonating with you. Something is on fire inside of you. Do you know what that is? That is God granting you belief. That is God granting you belief. Here's what this passage tells us or tells you to do. To receive Him. To receive Him. And to receive Him is to put your allegiance to Christ Jesus, to give him your allegiance, to reorganize your life around him, to say, Jesus, I don't want to trust anything else for new creation. I trust you for new creation. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. You are the one that has my hope. That's what it means to receive Christ. And I here on Christmas Eve's Eve want to give you an opportunity to do that if you've never done that. I want to invite everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. And now is a moment to think and to listen and to meditate on what these scriptures have said, that everyone who believes in the name of the Son of God and who receives Him is reborn of God, is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Maybe this evening is that decision moment for you. That you are experiencing belief rising up in your heart right now in the name of the Son of God. I would ask you as an expression of faith that you want to receive Him. With nobody looking around, would you just stick your hand up? Thank you. You you can put your hands down. You can look up here at me. 
thank you to those of you who put up your hands. This is, this is such good news for you. This is such good news for everyone who has put their faith in, in the name of Jesus Christ. For new creation has dawned in your life. And that is great means and reason for hope. This evening, we're going to sing. But before we do, I want to pray. And if you made that decision, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And I'm just going to have you repeat after me. And we all, all who have made this decision to put our faith in the name of the Son of God are going to pray along with you to support you. So everyone, bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you have believed in the name of the Son of God, say after me, Lord Jesus, I believe in your name for the forgiveness of my sins. And would you make me a new creation? I repent of the way I used to live. And I turn to you for hope, for joy, and for new life. In Jesus' name, amen.